you'll have to forgive me for not being able to tell you the page number that the scripture is on this morning because I didn't have time to look it up uh, when I came out of Sunday school. Uh, I'm going to be reading from 2 Corinthians, uh, the 8th chapter, verses 1 through 9, uh, chapter 8, 1 through 9, and I'm going to be referring to the story of the, of the uh, Magi, and if you will, let me just tell you, remind you of that story. I preached from it last week and want to build on what I preached about. Uh, but the story of the Magi is that three kings, or we say three kings, that kings from the east came to following a star to find where the Christ child was. And when they got to the city of Jerusalem, they asked where the Christ child would be born. And, of course, the prophets, knowing the scriptures, told them, uh, particularly the scripture in Micah, told them that uh, he, would be, he would be born in Bethlehem. Herod says to them, uh, gives to them the message that they need. And then Herod says, come back and let me know where he is so that I may go to worship him. Now, obviously, he wanted to go to do away with the child. But the shepherds, I'm sorry, the magi went down into, uh, into Bethlehem and uh, found the Christ child. And they worshipped him and they offered gifts. There were three gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And uh, then they left going back a different way so that they would not be, uh, uh, so that they would not have to report to uh, Herod. I want you to remember that story, and so that's the reason that I tried to refresh it in your memory. But I would like to read this scripture, 2 Corinthians, the 8th chapter, verses 1 through 9. And this is what scripture says. Moreover, brethren, we do to wit, to wit of the grace of God bestowed on the churches in Macedonia, how that in a great trial of affliction the abundance of their joy and deep poverty abounded unto the riches of their liberality. That is, when they got down in the dumps, they gave gifts so that they could help uh, people elsewhere. For to their power I bear record, yea, and beyond their power, they were willing of themselves, praying us with much entreaty that we would receive the gift and take upon us the fellowship of the ministering to the saints. And this they did, not as we had hoped, but first gave their own selves to the Lord and to us by the will of God. They first gave themselves to the Lord and to us by the will of God. Insomuch that we desired Titus, that as he had begun, so he would also finish in you the same grace also. Therefore, as ye abound in everything, in faith, utterance, knowledge, diligence, and in your love to us, See that ye abound in this grace also. I speak not by commandment, but by occasion of the forwardness of others and to prove the sincerity of your love. And then pay close attention to verse 9. For we know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for our sakes, or your sakes, he became poor, that ye through his poverty might be rich. Paul was taking up an offering and sending it to Jerusalem so that the church at Jerusalem, who was in the midst of a famine, uh, and we, you and I don't know what famines really are. You scrabbled for food then, scrambled for food then, and for something to drink. You had to in order to live. And so they were taking, the churches were taking up an offering, and Paul is wanting to take it back. To Jerusalem and in that process of gathering together the offerings that were to be given 
Paul makes a statement about the Lord Jesus Christ that has stirred in me some thoughts that I want to share with you. The first, let me say this first, firstly. One of the most beautiful Christmas stories that's ever been written is O. Henry's The Gift of the Magi. Some of you may know that story and some of you may not. For there was a husband and a wife who loved each other dearly. And they had prized possessions that they loved dearly as well. The husband had a watch. And that watch was a beautiful watch. And it was a watch that he carried in his pants. He carried with him everywhere he went. The wife had long, beautiful hair. And she loved her hair. At nighttime, she would uh, brush it out so that, so that the husband could admire her hair. They had very little to eat and no money, no money. O. Henry says that they each decided what they would do. The woman goes and sells her hair to get some money so that she could give it to her husband get a, wa a, a watch fob and give it to her husband to go on his watch. A fob is a chain, by the way. And the man goes and sells his watch to buy a comb for the woman to comb her lovely hair. On Christmas morning, they had two gifts to give and neither gift was useful for the watch was gone and the hair was gone I like that story because of the irony in it I like that story because it tells of the great love that each had for the other that they would sell their most, pr most prized possession to give it to the one that they loved so wonderfully and so greatly and then I read, for you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that ye through his poverty might be made rich. Christmas and giving are always identified together. That's the first thought that I had. When you think of Christmas, you think of children. You think of giving to those children. And the biblical story of the wise men links giving with Christmas. It's inextricably, inextricably given to us. So we can't separate the two. Christmas and giving. Even though our gifts are given with the best intent of intentions they may be understood. There was a wealthy Easterner, for instance, wanting to outdo his Texas cousin in sending a gift to his grandmother. So he purchased one of the most unusual gifts that you could, that you could, uh, could give to a person, a zerker bird. He paid $25,000 for that zerker. And that Zerka could speak five languages and sing three arias from operas. And with great excitement, he called her the day after Christmas and said to his grandmother, how did you, how did you like the Zerka bird? And she said, he was delicious. <laughs> now, I want you to, I want you to think about what went through his head. But I also want you to think of something else. You can believe that the purpose of the gifts of the Magi were not lost on the Christ child. He was a child. But they gave him three gifts. And those three gifts show that he was a prophet and a priest 
and a king. The gift of gold, which is rare and, and cannot, be, cannot rust, <clears throat> was fitting to give to a reigning king. The frankincense, which was used in worship and depicted Jesus as the prophet, the one who spoke forth the good news of God's love. And the myrrh was a pungent uh, gum rosin that was used in burial and as a pain reliever and showed Jesus as the priest. So when the prophets, when the Magi came, they gave to him gifts that indicated what his life was going to be on this earth. He was going to be a prophet and a priest and a king. So giving is inextricably linked to Christmas. But then there's another thought that came to me. And that is that Christmas itself is God's gift to humanity, to all of us. Paul depicted Jesus as God's gift to all of us. Listen again to verse 9. For ye know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, he was rich. He had everything in the world and the universe and heaven, everything. And he, for our sakes, became poor, born in a stable, put in a manger, because he was poor. He grew up poor. And yet, he was poor and accepted it, but he did so that we, through his poverty, might be rich. You know, sometimes I think about what it is to be rich. And I've heard in all these political, political things going on that there were rich people involved in the, in the election and it went this way and that according to the rich men of the election. And yet, if those men don't have the greatest gift of all, their riches won't count worth of lip. They won't. They won't. You see, in urging the Gentile Christians to make a gift to those needy Jewish Christians, he reminded them that the incentive that, uh, that God had given his son to them, that was the incentive that was going to be used so that they would give. Although rich beyond compare, Jesus was willing to give up all of that to come to earth for you and us. Our Lord's gift is an ideal of the true giving, if you stop to think about it. His was not a bargain that was struck. His was not a bribe that was offered. His was not an exchange that was made. His was not an investment that was put aside. He freely gave and unconditionally of himself. Listen to this. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Now that kind of giving is staggering when you stop to think about it. But then there's another way to look at Christmas and giving. Christmas is both a gift and a challenge. It's God's gift, the real gift, that has two qualifications. It must be given with no strings attached, and it must not be costless to the giver. It's got to cost him something. Remember those two that I mentioned to you in the gift of the Magi? One gave her hair because she loved her husband so well in order to buy a fob for his watch. 
and the husband who loved his wife so well that he was willing to give up his watch to buy her a comb for her hair. And neither gift could be used. But they gave it anyway. You see, it must be given with no strings attached. And it must not be costless to the, to, to, to the giver. It must cost him something. God's gift to us meets these qualifications. His gift was given not because of our goodness, but because of our need. Not because of our loveliness, but because of his love for us. No other religion offered a God who gave himself. No other religion. There are gods in other religions who were who had relationships with human beings and those became demigods. I mentioned this to my Sunday school class this morning. They became demigods. But pagans, the paganism speaks of men leaving the world to become gods, but no other religion offers the world to, to offers to come into the world as a man but God. There's a story that I will, will illustrate what I'm trying to say to you. There was a longtime pastor in Maryland and Virginia who told a very penetrating story about a mission field that he was, he was there to cover in the Far East. And in Hong Kong, he came upon a moving and touching scene. Outside a bakery, <coughs> there was a hungry little girl who had fallen asleep with her cheeks pressed to the windowpane of that bakery. She was asleep, and she could not get to what she needed and wanted and loved. So he snapped a picture of that scene. And when presenting it back when he got into the States again in his slide presentation, he always climaxed his sermon with a picture, <coughs> that picture, and an appeal for people to share Christ and the who is the bread of the world and share it with a hungry world who is in need of the bread of life. Following the sermon on one occasion, he, there was a fellow that was waiting who was in the congregation and he lingered behind and he said to the preacher, and what did you do about it? And what did you do about it? About what? He said, about the little girl asleep at the bakery window. You know, that question comes to all of us. What will we do about it? We have an opportunity through your church. You have an opportunity through your church to help people come to know Christ as their Savior right there. You have this Christmas time the opportunity to help two families have a Christmas that is far beyond what they ever dreamed they could have. What are you going to do about it? I want you to remember that the gift of Christmas is an eternal gift. It's not only for this world, but it's for the world to come. It's good for life and it's good for death. And here the challenge rings out loud and clear to all of us, when we think of Christmas, we must think of giving, but not just giving to one another. There needs to be some gifts that we can give this Christmas that are beyond monetary value. I think a lot of times, Jimmy, you had it made when you were dean of a college. 
And yet you came to Norman Park as the pastor of a church. And I often wondered why God led me to Norman Park Church. And I've come across in my thinking someone that taught me how to give. Buddy Horn taught me how to give. But he never told me this. But a black guy who worked at the assembly said, if it hadn't been for Carl Wesley and Buddy Horn, we would never have had a Christmas. We would never have had a Christmas. I want you to think about that. That's not somebody way off out yonder in a picture like the baby against the window pane. It's not somebody way off out yonder working with a mission. It was right here where we live. Right here where you and I live. That's what giving is at Christmas time. And that didn't happen just one time. Carl Wesley and Buddy had let many a person know what Christmas was all about. I hope this Christmas that you can say that God gave to you the greatest gift in this world, his only begotten son, so that whoever believes on him should not perish but have everlasting life. If you don't feel you can give money and give things that cost you from your bank account, you can give the greatest gift that ever there was. Become a friend to a lost person and share Jesus with that person. What a gift. What a gift. Paul says it like this. Though he was rich, Yet for your sakes he became poor, that ye through his poverty might be rich. Would you bow your heads with me, please? <clears throat> Our Heavenly Father, <clears throat> when we think of what Jesus gave for us, We usually think that he died only. But we don't think about the fact that he left the riches of glory and came to the earth to be a poor traveling preacher. He came to this earth and left all the riches of glory. He came to this earth so that we may have those riches for ourselves. I pray that if there's one here who needs to know Christ as his Savior, that he may come to know him as he admits to God, Lord, I'm a sinner. I cannot save myself. I need some help. I believe that Jesus is your son, and I believe that he was raised from the dead for my sins. Thank you for giving to us a wonderful Lord for whom a wonderful holiday is named. For after all, it is a church service for Christ. It is a Christ mass. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And now I pray that the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ